Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the IFSO 31st uh, Journal Club. Uh, we're delighted and glad to have uh, a great um, study done by um, the authors from University of Naples, and it's going to be presented by Dr. Antonio Vitiello. Welcome, Hi. Antonio. And uh, we have we have Professor Mario Musala as well with us, who's also one of the authors and well known to all of us. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hamad. Thank you, Dr. Bashir, for your kind introduction. And uh, well, by my side, I'm happy and honored to 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 be here with you today we are going to present uh, uh, one of our last studies and uh, this study has been um, uh, ideated has been has been investigated by antonio that is my right hand man is uh, uh, one of the wonderful legacy i have the the chance to find here when i moved from my old department to this new this new working position and uh, he's an excellent uh, investigator, he's an excellent surgeon, please not, I have not say the bariatric surgeon, he's an excellent surgeon and well, uh, there is a, a, a interesting background regarding this study and uh, well, the background, uh, uh, the, the, the background is to compare the long-term efficacy of Two, two techniques that are, are are very popular. Well, the first one has been very popular, that is adjustable gas, gastric banding, and the second one is a sleeve gastrectomy. This is probably is currently or surely the, the most performant procedure worldwide. So uh, Antonio uh, uh, made a, a matched comparison in a very long-term setting, that is 10 years, and he has found very interesting results that we have shared with you all uh, through uh, our publication and that Antonio is going to present now to the uh, old friends and colleagues that are in connection with us. So welcome Antonio and please uh, the floor is the virtual, the virtual floor is yours. Before we start with Antonio, let me just make uh, a few uh, notes. This is uh, recorded and will be available in, to you, uh, to all members on the Virtual Academy and later to all the public on the YouTube, if so, YouTube channel. And uh, if you have any question, meanwhile, please type your questions in the question section and we'll get to those after the presentation. Uh, Antonio was so kind to prepare three polls to us to see uh, the uh, how the audience uh, basically perform gastric banding uh, and let's launch the the first poll manual if you can so which is the most commonly performed procedure in your practice antonio what do you do now in your practice uh, mostly in the practice directed by professor mario Mutella, i think that uh, there is a fair Fight in between the ORGB and the sleeve, but I think this year the ORGB will be the first procedure. I think we're going to do more ORGB than sleeve. Great, and let's see what the audience uh, does. So it's basically representative of uh, what is done worldwide. So 62% sleeves, second uh, most common is the Roux and Y, uh, and no, the yes is among the the uh, audience. Uh, let's launch the second poll, Manuela, if you we can, Stephanie. Which is the rate of conversion from sleeve gastrectomy in your practice? And uh, we know what it is uh, within your practice, uh, uh, which you published uh, just uh, in yeah, this I'm paper, and you're going to present I'm it. Curious to know what will be the answer. Let's allow a few seconds more. Uh, 
And let's see what the audience says, Manuel. So majority is less than 5% and 5 to 10%, 10 to 15% is 18%. And uh, the higher we go, the less it becomes. So low rate of conversion among the audience. And the last poll, do you still perform gastric banding? And, you know, uh, I know that you performed gastric banding before, but do you still do it, uh, Professor Musala and Antonio? Well, currently has been almost abandoned. Uh, I mean, uh, last year we probably placed a couple of banding in a more than 300 procedures so it is 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 a very small number and well who knows in the future but currently we, we are not performing any longer i would say it depends and let's see the audience actually seven percent say still perform banding regularly and 28 percent in selected patients so the band still has a place among the audience uh, Antonio, I think the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I think I can start with my presentation. I think Manuela can help me with the uh, start with uh, uh, my presentation. Manuela. Hi everyone. This is Antonio Vitello from the University of Naples. Uh, I want to thank very much the IPSO for inviting me to this prestigious journal club, and I want to thank Dr. Bashir for hosting this prestigious journal club. I'm going to present data of our paper published on obesity surgery. But before you know explaining the results of our uh, article, I would like to briefly you know, remind us the, uh, the history of restrictive surgery. One of the first most commonly performed bariatric uh, procedure in uh, the restrictive field was the vertical band gastroplasty, which was introduced in 1982 by Dr. Mason. This procedure was abandoned in the laparoscopic era of bariatric surgery, but still in 2010, we can find this article published on annals by an Italian group who was showing uh, that uh, the excess weight loss at 10 years was still 59.8%, and also the conversion rate was just 10%. But in the laparoscopic era, the vertical banded gastroplasty was uh, replaced by a more feasible bariatric and laparoscopic procedure, which was the gastric band. Uh, the gastric band was, uh, as we know, as we already know, was one of the most commonly performed procedure. It was very popular at the end of the 90s and uh, in the first years of this millennium. But then some articles uh, started showing that this procedure has a high rate of failure and removal in long term like this in a very nice paper published by Dr. Suter on obesity surgery in 2006. And in this paper, we can see that at seven years, the failure rate was 6.9%. Uh, but I invite you also to look better at the figure because you can already see that there is an excess weight loss with the band, uh, durable excess weight loss with the band, and there was a 43% success rate in or uh, also in the study with the band at seven years. And uh, there is also this other article published in 2013 on obesity surgery in which uh, the eminent authors have uh, reported their long-term results with the band. And you can see that the, that the excess weight loss beyond 10 years was, uh, uh, was satisfactory. And also they did a systematic review of the literature and um, they showed that there was a, a decrease of the experimentation rate with the advent of the pass flash technique and with the use of the new uh, band devices. Also, they compared the long-term uh, excess weight loss of the band with other procedures, and they showed that uh, the excess weight loss uh, in long term was comparable with the ones of the gastric bypass and of the gastroplasty, only the switch had a significant, significantly higher uh, weight loss. Despite 
these findings, we know that uh, last decade and maybe in the last 15 years, the sleeve gastrectomy has completely taken over the restrictive field of bariatric surgery. And we know that this procedure was initially conceived as a first step uh, for a worldwide gastric bypass or for a duodenal switch in um, laparoscopically complicated patients, uh, like the super obese patients. But due to the good weight loss that you can uh, obtain with this procedure, it, it became uh, rapidly, quickly a standalone procedure. And indeed, in this survey in 2006, we have demonstrated that the sleeve gastrectomy had become the most uh, commonly performed bariatric procedure. If we take a look at the picture, we can see that it is clear that from the 2008 to 2016, there was a continuous rise of the sleeve gastrectomy, while there was a continuous decrease of the gastric band. And from the 2015, uh, there was also a decrease of the roux and white gastric paper, a bypass in favor of the sleeve gastrectomy. I, when I was a surgical trainee, I witnessed, uh, witnessed that change. I mean, when I, in my previous department, we were doing a lot of uh, restrictive procedures. And uh, when I started the training, we were doing a lot of pounds. When I, start, when I finished my training, we were doing a lot of sleeves. Then I asked myself a simple question, is the sleeve always a bad procedure? So that's the reason why I did this study for the final exam of my uh, surgical training and I published it on uh, obesity surgery. And uh, I did a retrospective uh, case matched comparison of the sleeve gastrectomy and uh, BAM. And as you can see, the answer to my question was very clear. In the first years after the, the procedure, the weight loss is significantly higher uh, with the sleeve gastrectomy. And also, if we take a look at the Reynolds criteria, it is clear that you have better results, significantly better results with the sleeve compared to the palm. Afterwards, I moved to another department in which I'm working now with Professor Mario Musella, and we um, had access to a larger database because uh, now there is only one bariatric department, which is the one directed by Professor Musella in uh, our university. And we have a larger database, and we have decided to do report our um, experience with the band, 10 years experience with the band. And we also published our, uh, our results. And as you can see, uh, it's clear that you have um, average uh, weight loss, excess weight loss after the band, which is not satisfactory because it's uh, under uh, 50%. But still, if you decide to keep the band in those patients who have uh, excess weight loss, which is not over 50, but it's not you know, under 25, so they have an insufficient weight loss, but they don't have a non-response. No they don't have a um, failure you can still maintain this 30-40%, this average 40% of excess weight loss, even in long term with a low uh, percentage of removal and conversion. Also, we uh, have published another study uh, in which we have reported our results at five years with this lean in super obese patients. And we have noticed that yes, at five years, the excess, excess BMI loss is still 56.4. So it's still satisfactory, the average weight loss. But if we take a look at the rate of patients uh, with uh, BMI over 35, we can see that uh, this rate is 64%. So these patients after five years, 64% of them, they are still candidates for bariatric surgery. And also there was a very high rate of the novel GERD after um, surgery, after sleeve in uh, super obese patients. So I wanted you know, to see um, the results of the sleeve gastrectomy in long terms in uh, literature. And I found very strange that there was a lack of long-term reports of the sleeve. I found this article of 2016 in which they were already reporting that, uh, at, that at 10 years, the conversion rate after the gastrectomy was 25%. One out of four patients uh, was going to be converted after the sleeve in this, uh, in this article. Also last year, the group of Dr. Prague and Dr. Falsarak published a very nice article in which they reported the review of literature 
on the on the long term results of zig gastrectomy and you can see that the average weight loss after the 5 year the 5 year is um, the 50 year is uh, you know between 40 and 50 and also you can have a high rate of conversion the authors they reported the uh, rate of conversion at 10, at 10 years at this rate was 35.8% so very high rate of conversion also, this article was published in Obesity Surgery last year, and uh, you can see clearly from the figure that the, the, the weight loss is going to decrease with time. And after the five year, we have a serious weight regain. Also, they had 32.4% uh, of uh, the novel reflux, and uh, one fifth of the patients were converted to another procedure due to reflux or weight uh, regain. So I kept you know, doing that, I kept asking myself that question again, are we sure that the sleeve is really that better than the pan? I was sure I had the results from uh, the previous study that the, uh, the, the sleeve was better in the, five, the first five years. So I asked myself if the, these results were maintained in long term, also because as I told you before, while, while I was a trainee, I witnessed the, uh, that wave of patients coming to cleaning and asking for conversion after the ban. And now I'm witnessing, and I'm sure this is happening also in your centers, there is a huge uh, percentage of patients uh, who had this leave in the past and they are looking for another procedure. They are not happy anymore with the weight loss or they are suffering with reflux. So I basically did what I did also in the other study. I looked for all the still patients with a 10 year follow up. I matched them with uh, a patient who had gastric band in the same period of time. And I did the matching uh, using uh, the BMI, the age and the sex. Of course, for a given BMI unit, I gave a tolerance of one plus minus year of uh, age. And uh, of course, due to the matching, I had two very comparable uh, in terms of uh, two very comparable groups in terms of uh, male female ratio, age, and initial BMI. We had also called, we were very lucky because we had also comparable, uh, comparable rate of uh, patients with diabetes and hypertension. And also, this is very important the preparative rate of care was comparable in the two groups. Then I looked are the results in terms of weight loss. And uh, as you can see from the figure, the outcomes are very clear. As I already demonstrated uh, to myself in the previous article, in the first years after the procedure, the sleeve is clearly superior to the, uh, to the band. But if we take a look at the BMI, uh, to the values of the BMI of the excess weight loss, of the total weight loss, and of the excess BMI loss, these values are comparable between the two groups at 10 years. Also, if you take a look at the, at the rate of patients with a failure, meaning an excess weight loss under 25%, or at the rate, at the, the, if you look at the rates of patients with an excess weight loss above 50%, so the patients who had a success, you can see that these rates, these percentages are comparable in the, in the two groups again at 10 years. Also, if we take a look at the Reynolds criteria, this, this criteria basically tells us, uh, tell us that at, 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 the, at the 10th year, you have that uh, half of the patients, they have still a BMI over 35 in both groups. So half of the patients, they are still candidate for bariatric surgery after the sleeve and after the band. Moreover, if we take a, a look at the conversion removal rate, we can see that the main reason in both groups for uh, removal or uh, conversion was the insufficient weight loss. It was not a complication and uh, the two rates were comparable. But what is very important is that we uh, preparatively, preparatively, we had the same rate of uh, GERD, postoperatively, the rate of GERD is higher after the sleep. And this is a serious, a serious concern since we know that we, two meta-analyses have been published on this topic. Uh, we can see this is the one published on JAMA surgery showing that the rate of new onset GERD after sleep is 20%. And this other article is also showing that the rate of the novel GERD is 23% and the rate of worsening is 19%. 
So we should not underestimate this problem of uh, reflux after the sleep in long term. And uh, it appears also higher than um, the rate that you have after the bump. Of course, we are well aware of the limits of our article, of the limitations of our article, because we know that these are small sample size. The, the only importance is that we, we have long term results. Also, we know that we are reporting our first experience with the sleeve, so probably we are performing larger sleeves than these days. Uh, we are also aware that we are reporting GERD uh, using clinical symptoms, and we didn't do endoscopy at 10 years in these patients. We didn't do manometry because he, you know it's difficult to convince the patients to do this procedure if you are not going to be converted. And, uh, but I want to remind, I think that our conclusions are solid uh, despite these limitations, because we are basically saying that we know that the sleeve is clearly superior to the band at the first year and, and at the fifth year, but uh, at, at the 10th year, the rate of conversions and the values of the weight loss are comparable. So this basically means that in selected patients the, who wants a restrictive procedure, they who don't want to be uh, submitted to a more invasive procedure, you can still uh, indicate a band. And on the contrary, when you perform a sleeve, you should always inform the patient that uh, there is a certain rate of conversion uh, to other procedures due to the risk of reflux or weight regain. Basically, if you want to go, if you want to go through the conclusion again with again with me, uh, if you're asking yourself, uh, if you're asking myself, if uh, I'm trying to say that the band is uh, should be again the restrictive procedure of choice, my answer is clearly no, uh, because we are not trying to demonstrate that the band is more effective or as effective as uh, the sleeve. We're not trying to say that the band sh should be performed more. We are just trying to say. Uh, that in selective uh, selected cases, you can still uh, indicate you know uh, this procedure, and don't tell me that there is no space for the band because you know we are desperately trying to find an endoscopic or laparoscopic procedure to perform in those patients who uh, have a moderate uh, obesity and who don't have uh, comorbidities. And uh, if, this, if these patients, they look for surgery and they don't want to have a sleeve or a more invasive procedure, we are trying to conceive, uh, to ideate uh, various kind of new procedures while uh, we still have the band. We know everything about the band and uh, its long-term results, which are not terrible. Also, again, we are not trying to say that the band is as effective as the sleeve. We are just trying to say that at 10 years, we found the same rate of conversion and uh, a, comparable, uh, a, a comparable value of uh, weight loss. So this, is means, uh, this means that, that when you have a patient and you, are, uh, and you are going to perform a sleeve, you have to tell this patient that after uh, long term, after the fifth year, there is a certain rate of conversion to another procedure due to weight regain or due to reflux. And uh, you should inform the patient about the risk to be converted to gastric bypass or to the mini bypass or to another procedure. You should tell them that the sleeve was a first step and maybe in some patients will remain a first step procedure. Actually, in my in the unit of Professor Musella, it's happening now that the patients are coming and they are already aware of the risks of weight regain from after the sleeve because they've been informed by their friends, colleagues, or other patients who had the sleeve in the past and who had uh, regained the part, uh, part of the weight. I want to end my presentation also saying that I've been very happy to see that uh, our article has been uh, shared many times, has been viewed many times, and there is also some discussion, there are also some discussions and some criticism on the social media. I've been also involved in, in some uh, debates on the results. And uh, first, I want to thank you, everyone, for sharing our article, for taking interest in our article. And uh, also, those I want to thank also those who are critics about our um, article. And uh, the main criticism that I have found is that 
everyone is uh, looking at a uh, selection bias. Everyone is trying to justify this, uh, this not satisfactory results of the sleeve gastrectomy at 10 years, saying that maybe we uh, made uh, some bias, uh, we, we uh, had a bias in the selection of the patients. But uh, actually, I did the case match retrospective procedure to eliminate the bias. I had also this comment from a reviewer. He was saying, oh, you have the uh, comparable results at 10 years because you did the matching, but it's the opposite. You do the matching to avoid bias and to compare two treatments in two comparable group of patients. Also, I want to answer to this criticism with uh, my personal belief. And my personal belief is that I totally agree with you because uh, if you take a look at the, uh, this is the last survey from IFSO and the last survey from the Italian Society of Obesity Surgery, you can see that in both surveys, the rate of sleeve is 55%. So I agree with you, there is a selection bias, but there is a selection bias with the sleeve now, like we had in the past with the band. The problem is that maybe sometimes we are, we are over-indicating restrictive surgery. We are over indicating now the sleeve gastrectomy and we should be aware of this or in the future we'll be converting loads of patients. Eventually, again, I want to thank you all for uh, joining us in this uh, IFSO Journal Club uh, and uh, let me thank Professor Mario Mosella because as I said before, I started working with Professor Mosella after my surgical training and he gave me really the chance to grow as a surgeon, as a researcher, as a scientist. And uh, this paper comes from the great collaboration that I'm having and I hope to have in the future with Professor Mosella. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. Not able to hear you. Yeah, thank you, um, Antonio, for this comprehensive um, overview of your work, which is extremely interesting. Uh, I've read through the article myself. Um, very interesting data, and uh, looking forward to the questions from the audience once again. If you have any question, please type in your question in the question section, and we'll get to it. Let me start the discussion, uh, uh, Antonio. The one thing uh, I'm missing uh, uh, from the manuscript is, um, did the band patients have different types of band or was it only one type? Well, uh, the patients mainly had uh, the lap band, but they were not all the same type. Uh, so, some of them, uh, but mostly I, low I, pressure. At, at that time, we used, I mean, I think many 90% had a lap band, just a very mm -hmm. few percentage had other kind of bands like the helio, the ones from Erega. Uh, and none had high pressure, low volume bands? No. Okay, great. Uh, my second uh, uh, note was, um, some would say you had uh, great results with the uh, band patients. Um, how, how were you able to obtain this uh, uh, successful uh, uh, outcome and uh, good results within your band population? Well, actually that's not completely true because we did not have that satisfactory result with the band. Just that at 10, 10 years, the results of the sleeve were not uh, that good. And also, also, I want you to remind that uh, when I uh, showed the article that we published with Professor Mosella about our results at 10 years with the band, we said that uh, we had a low rate of removal uh, because we decided to skip the band in these 10 years in those patients with an excess weight loss, which was not satisfactory, but was not a non-response, was not a failure. I mean, if you have a patient who doesn't want to have another procedure, a more invasive procedure, who had a 30, 40 percent excess weight loss, which means, you know, that's not a success, but that's not a failure either. You decide to keep the band, uh, the patient
patient has no complication and doesn't want to have uh, doesn't want to be converted to another procedure the patient, if the patient is happy you can keep the band and you can maintain the weight loss in long term because i think uh, that's the reason why i showed also some studies of the long-term results of the band because there is a high rate of removal but the highest person at the highest part of the removal is due to insufficient weight loss not due to complication it's this shared idea that you know you the band was mainly removed due to frequent complications it was mainly removed it was mainly removed because the axis of loss was not satisfactory so when you decide to keep the band in those patients who doesn't want to have another procedure with bmi it was uh, exit weight loss is under 50 but it's not uh, under 25 you can still maintain that exit weight loss in long term and uh, we have a question from the audience, uh, Dr. Guillermo Ponce de Leon. He's asking, uh, what was the rate of band-related complications over 10 years? And did you analyze the incidence of up upper GI symptoms other than GERD in patients who underwent banding? Yes, that's a very good question. I think we have partially already answered this question because uh, the main, you know, uh, the, the vast majority of the patients were converted in most groups for insufficient weight loss, not for complications. The complications uh, rate was very low. Uh, indeed, I want to remind you, you know, we have this uh, idea that the band is related to a high rate of complications. The, high, the rate, I think, was 4% in our uh, in our experience, because you have a low rate of uh, uh, slippage or low rate of migration with the new devices, of course you still have a high rate of you know not satisfactory excess weight loss, but you don't have a high rate of complications. And what was the second question again? The second question was, did you analyze the incidence of ah, yes, upper yes, GI yes. symptoms? Yeah, that's a very good question, a fair question, because of course if there is a serious problem after the, the sleep maybe after the band there is no GERD but there is risk of dysphagia because it's like a calathea like you know uh, device so maybe you can have patients with uh, se severe or, or moderate dysphagia and sometimes that's the reason why you have to remove the band now uh, professor uh, Mosala, um, you know we know that uh, uh, you noticed 25%, almost 25% de novo GERD within your sleeve uh, patients. Um, do you consider um, GERD uh, contraindication for, to, uh, for a patient to undergo sleeve gastrectomy? And uh, do you perform additional testing to those patients who complain of GERD prior um, before you offer sleeve gastrectomy? Yes, I would say yes. I mean, if if a patient come to my to my observation and is presenting some GERD, uh, especially well, the issue is quite sliding. I mean, we know that a lot of obese patients uh, present uh, reflux because of their high intra-abdominal pressure. So, I believe that some of these patients can improve by losing weight regardless of the surgery you are offering him okay so uh, i believe that when a patient come to to our to our units to our observation we should understand which is the the type of reflux is suffering from i mean sometimes they are functional i mean they are they are really they are really uh, reflux some patients and you can assess this by uh, functional studies as the 24-hour pH uh, manometry, uh, impedanceometry or manometry. And it is very important. In some other cases, their reflux is just because they are fat, you know, they're obese. So it's very important, in my opinion, to, to, to distinguish, to make a difference between these two classes of patients in, in well, Remaining to your questions, uh, to your question, uh, I would say that in any case, if a patient is presenting with uh, B graders of agitis, C graders of agitis, it is better not to offer him a sleep gastrectomy, for, of course. And uh, uh, within your study, um, did you perform any endoscopy preoperatively? I know you mentioned selectively, 
um, uh, or pH testing in, in any of those patients? That's a uh, question from John Sebastian Land from the audience. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, all patients undergoing uh, a sleeve gastrectomy uh, receive a preoperative and upper GI study, I mean GDS mainly. And uh, if, it, if it is the case, we go further with some functional studies. Great, thank you. And another question from uh, Mohib Iskandaros. Uh, don't you think that 15% conversion is high where some of those undergoing conversion uh, should have got bypass rather than a restrictive procedure? Can I answer this question? Yes, please go ahead, Antonio. Uh, yes, you see that that's that's the same question again. There must be a selection bias. You know, there must be something wrong with the selection bias. You, you, some, uh, you know, some colleagues they just uh, have troubles in accepting the fact that this leave was conceived as a first step, and in some cases, you know, uh, especially in super in patients with super obesity, uh, can they can still uh, require a further procedure. And uh, a real, you know, real life story. Uh, yesterday in the outpatient clinic uh, came two patients. One had a gastric bound in 2008, and uh, his excess weight loss was not satisfactory at all, but was not under 25. He kept the band. He wants to be to keep the band. He's not ecstatic about the procedure, and of course they're not advising to perform you know, the band as the procedure choice. But still, there is a space. On the other end, there was this patient. She was 19 at the end uh, of the surgery. Her BMI was 55. She was suffering with super obesity. She had this leave, and uh, because she was 19, uh, she didn't want to, and her parents also they didn't want to, you know, something more invasive. She had this leave. She w went down to a BMI was 37. Okay, now she has the third year. Her BMI has gone up to uh, 45 again. So. She clearly came to the clinic asking for the bypass now. So that's the real point. The, it's not that, you know, I agree with the, uh, with the colleague. The problem is that we are over indicating this lead. It's not normal that in 63, we have seen the answers before, you know, 63% of centers, this leave is the first procedure. I mean that there are some centers, let's be clear, honest about this, there are some centers in which the 80, 90 percent of the procedures are sleeve, and you know this is gonna cause uh, loads of conversion more than 15 percent in next year. Thank you, Antonio. And uh, Ruhi Fazal is also asking about the follow-up rate between sleeve and uh, banding patients. Um, uh, is there a difference? Uh, I know you stated it in in within the manuscript, but if you can explain it to to her, it's basically the same because of course, as any other bariatric procedure, the patient is uh, followed up at one month, three months, six months, one year, and then yearly. Of course, with the band, it's a slightly different because if the patient has any problem or if he feels dysphagia, he can come you know earlier to the clinic to have a regulation with uh, with the band. But mainly after the first year, the patients are followed up yearly, once per year. Thank you, Antonio. Now, when I look at your population, uh, the initial BMI is actually 45, which is quite heavy, um, considering the bariatric uh, population. Um, and majority were females, but still, 45 is a bit uh, heavier to start which uh, will have a significant patients with BMIs over 50 as well. Um, um, we know that patients above 50 do not lose as much weight with um, um, bariatric surgery as much as other patients. Did you look at different subsets among your population? Let's say less than 40, above 40, was there a difference in achieving excess weight loss above 50 or less than 25 um, within your population? We didn't, be, we didn't do this, you know, subdivision of the groups because, you know, the sample size, the entire sample size is not very big. So you can really not compare groups of 20 patients each. 
the results will not be you know, important, valuable, reliable. Uh, but of course, um, you know, in the previous study, the one on 2017, if you can remember, I just decided to include patients with a BMI in between 40 and 50. I excluded the uh, patients with super obesity. And maybe this, uh, this is important. I, I want to underline also this, this, this point because uh, I think that the sleeve really doesn't work in long term with uh, patients with super obesity or with a high BMI. Probably, you know, this should be considered uh, when we indicate the procedure. But it's even more important if we consider that the sleeve was, you know, conceived as a first step for patients with super obesity, and it's often performed in these patients because they are complicated patients laparoscopically, lapar laparoscopically wise. So probably we should start, you know, informing these patients that there is the risk of conversion to another procedure, or we should probably start deciding on doing another procedure in these patients. Uh, let's uh, of note, um, EFSO is uh, gearing towards uh, adopting people's first language, uh, and Manuela shared that with me. Um, certain uh, aspects like super obesity is no longer uh, going to be encouraged. So BMI above 50, uh, describing a patient uh, as obese may um, rather use patients with obesity or suffering from obesity. Um, I, want just to to, I want to apologize. No, no worries, Antonio. Uh, I know it's um, among um, our, our population, but we'll hopefully improve on that. Um, and yeah. another question, Please go ahead, Professor Masai. Oh, oh, if I can make a comment, uh, uh, I, I believe this this paper is interesting because, uh, like all papers showing results uh, following ten or more years, it, it shows us uh, how different is bariatric surgery and the solutions bariatric surgery can offer. If we are talking at, at a period that is between two or three years, and if we are looking at the period that it's longer than 10 years. Uh, this is very uh, impressive, the difference you can you can meet. And uh, this is the reason because uh, I, I always say to, to all my surgeons or the staff, uh, when we are describing a new technique, when we are suggesting a new approach, a new surgical approach in bariatric surgery, we always should have results at that at least must be longer than five years. You know, uh, currently there's a lot of new procedures coming out, especially endoscopic procedures, uh, presenting with, with very good results in the immediate period, in the, in the very short period. And this is uh, on one side interesting, but we know as surgeons, as physicians, that sometimes there is a lot of pressure coming from the uh, the marketing of production or involved of, uh, of, of course, um, involved in the production, and uh, we should we should be aware of this when we are suggesting a new technique. So all our results should be at least coming from a five years follow up. I completely agree with you, Professor Mosala. And with that comes a question from uh, Professor Jan Gray. Can you identify the patients that performed well within your uh, gastric banding population? Uh, like, let's say, who would you advise to undergo a gastric band now? Well, as I was commenting a few minutes before, uh, it's a very small number of patients that we uh, candidate, that we suggest for, for a band. Well, the ideal is uh, patients between uh, female patients between 38 and I don't know 42 probably, and young probably, and especially that is the most important thing uh, that is available to uh, undergo a very strict follow up because the difference in the digital makes all the difference of the world. If the patient is complaining, if the patient is available to undergo a follow-up, especially with a band, is probably a good candidate for this procedure. Uh, you know, well, Antonio knows very well, of course, uh, our population in 
in South Italy, is uh, there's a lot of people coming there looking for good results in the short term, the brief periods, and after you lose them at follow up. So by placing a, a band and uh, uh, thinking you're going to lose these patients at follow up is not very is not very smart. It's, it's not very useful. So. Once again, the ideal is the female patient between 38 and 42 available to undergo follow-up for a long period. Great. Uh, another question from Dr. Lane. Do you perform sleeve gastrectomy after gastric banding um, in a young population? If yes, is it in one step or two steps? Uh, well, uh, Antonio can answer for me, but I would say never you can replace restriction with more restriction is is not very logical in our experience but well there's surgeons doing these uh, removing band and do his leaves but it's not our policy currently in 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 my unit we are we if we are removing band we are looking for uh, malabsorptive, malabsorptive or hypoabsorptive procedure as, as a when y gastro bypass or when asomosis gastro bypass and and that's what you mentioned uh, within your patient population. But interestingly, one patient had a re-sleeve um, afterwards. Um, what was the criteria for that patient to have a re-sleeve? You know, the, the, in that case, it was the patient that he didn't want to have any other kind of procedure. So since he had the weight regain, we tried with the uh, re-sleeve. But in the... Now, in the department of Professor Mario Mostella, we really do not advise to this procedure. In that case, Antonio did the surgery. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We should all have fellows uh, doing re sleeves. <laughs> um, uh, so, to conclude, um, now that we know that 10 years outcomes are comparable uh, let's launch the last poll manuela um, would you consider offering gastric banding more after this study antonio what would you do how would you counsel the patients now well actually if the patient has a high pmi i would advise to do another procedure rather than the sleeve or the band and if the patient is very young as the professor mosello was saying a female she's she is willing to follow a strict follow follow up and she her bmi is not above 40 i would still propose the band you know in some selected cases i would still propose the band okay great and what's your approach for um, preparing patients for sleeve and uh, uh, gastric banding preoperatively? Do you do any functional studies in addition to an endoscopy? We do the same uh, preparative study for every patient in the Professor Mosella unit. We do uh, gastroscopy and uh, clinical evaluation of symptoms. And uh, you know, if the patient has a severe reflux, uh, grade C esophagitis, we decide for a one Y. If the patient has no uh, esophagitis or a grade A esophagitis or uh, no symptoms, you can really propose other procedure. And let's see what the patient uh, said. 24% said yes, and 76% still say no. However, and that's that's an improvement i think if 24 percent of the surgeons would perform more gastric banding your manuscript did something you know i want just to you know underline this point the the aim of the manuscript was not really you know to resuscitate the band was just to say that maybe you know we should not perform this leave in 60 70 percent of our patients that you know, because in long term you're gonna have a high rate of uh, conversion and so, reflux also. With that, Professor Musala, who would you not perform a sleeve to, given these results? Um, I, I will answer in a, in a larger way. I mean, probably the, the mistake that's 
most of us do is that we believe there's some colleagues believing that the concept of one size fits all you know and uh, in my opinion we have uh, uh, a lot of different weapons i mean different surgeries uh, some are easier some are more complicated to to be performed and we should never forget this sometimes we are perceived as supporters of just one procedure uh, for us, it could be the one anastomosis gastric bypass. For others, it could be the sleeve. But we all we should study very, very correctly and very strictly the patient before. Uh, so, uh, coming to your to your questions, in which in which patients I, I would not do a sleeve before uh, for, um, Well, patients presenting with uh, a, a very a very important BMI probably uh, higher than uh, 55 and uh, conversely all patients presenting with esophagitis that is higher than a big rate uh, this would be excluded from a, a sleep expectancy patients conversely if i go uh, higher than 60 of bmi probably sleep could be a, a, um, a shareable uh, first step uh, before going for for other for other surgeries. And uh, with that, I think uh, we conclude the discussion. Uh, any last note, uh, Antonio? I just want to say that it was really a privilege to be invited with uh, Professor Motel and you, Dr. Bashir. Thank you again for hosting this Kuzma Club. Thank you very much. It's really my privilege. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Professor Masada? has been a pleasure and an honor, of course, being part of this IFSO webinar. It's very interesting, very uh, didactic, and thank you for your uh, for being a chair chairman for this for this uh, presentation. And well, uh, despite this, I hope to meet you all soon in presence because we must come out from this nightmare of this virus. We we can stand it no longer. So. Uh, well, any any further occasion would be welcome to to meet you all in presence. Thank you so much, and see you soon. Thank you. Um, uh, prayers to everyone to pass this uh, pandemic, and hopefully meet you all soon. Thank you, Manuela and Stephanie, behind the the uh, screen uh, for all your work. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this is recorded. If you want to review it. Uh, send us any questions, comments, please do so. Uh, this presentation will be available on the Virtual Academy and the YouTube uh, channel. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, for all the interesting questions. Thank you very much.